everybody. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I would like to thank the organizing committee to uh, inviting me to talk on a topic that I like. It's um, teeth surgery in dairy cattle, and it will take me about 35 to 40 minutes to give you an overview on that. This is the, un the outline of my presentation. Introduction, I will shortly talk about anatomy, then I will focus on the various examination procedures, on generally on the prep for teeth surgery. I will make a, a real focus on the surgical interventions and then shortly go through aftercare and complications and wrap up everything with the take home messages. Teeth are extremely sensitive to trauma and a minimal dysfunction of a teat may cause premature cooling of the cow. So just a minimal trauma to the teat may cause the cow not to, to function properly anymore and the cow must be cold. Lacerations occur mainly around parturition. That's when cows have problems to get up but also they occur in the puerperal period and in the high production period because the other is then large and it is more prone to lacerations. Congenital pathologies are frequently not recognized by the farmer until first milking. And teeth pathologies are very frequently accompanied by mastitis. Milk of these animals is unsuitable for human consumption and as mastitis is the most relevant cause for premature culling in our dairies, it has a huge effect on the prognosis of teeth pathologies. I just want to repeat the anatomical terms I'm going to use during my presentation. I will talk about the gland tissue here, about the gland cistern or gland sinus here, about the venous ring or venous ring of Furstenberg, or annular ring that delineates the gland sinus distally. So this is the area of the big veins here. Then we have the teeth cistern or teeth sinus, and very important, the rosette of Furstenberg. It's the inner opening of the streak canal. Around the streak canal, we have the streak canal sphincter, consisting of various bundles of uh, smooth muscles. So it's a, a very simple anatomy. Now I would like to summarize the examination procedures that we usually use for working up teeth pathologies. They include visual inspection, palpation, hand milking or machine milking. Of course, you cannot do that all the time. If you have, for example, a perforating pathology, perforating laceration, you won't dry milking with the machine, but you do other things for examination of the respective pathology. We have to have a look at the milk. We want to be sure that, and we would like to know whether there is a mastitis present, yes or no. We can probe the streak canal, the rosette, and the teeth cistern. Then a very important instrument for working up Teeth pathologies is ultrasonography nowadays. It has completely replaced radiography. And in some cases, we may even decide to perform a telotomy or a teloscopy for working up of certain cases. Let's have a look at some pictures. Let's have a look at the three pictures here above. We see some swelling. We see some hematoma formation. There is a laceration at the outside of the teeth opening. There is a small laceration here. It looks much less dramatic than this laceration down here, but if we talk about prognosis, it may, might well be possible that this laceration down here, this one here, does not have the worst prognosis as compared to those. So there may be some problems inside the teeth that impede normal milk flow afterwards. In order to work up such problems that occur within the teeth, obstructing tissue that impedes with milk flow, 
I usually palpate the teeth. I take it between my thumb and index finger and I roll the teeth. And if I'm not sure, I just compare it with the contralateral side. It's a very easy procedure. An instrument that I like very much is this probe here. It's a probe according to Dr. Fritz. Um, on this side here, it allows you to measure the length of the streak canal. You introduce it through the streak canal. You pull it back a little bit until it stops at this area here. And in cases that there is obstructive or protruding tissue from the streak canal into the teeth cistern, the streak canal is seemingly longer as compared to the other side. And this is the way how we can diagnose um, an obstruction in the area of the Rosetta Furstenberg without any sonography. If you use the other side of this instrument, this, this hook here on the other side, it allows you to determine where exactly the obstructing tissue is located. Of course, ultrasonography is an instrumentation or a technique that we uh, use very frequently today for working up of teeth problems. Sagittal section, transversal section. If you only have a rectal probe available in your practice, what I suggest you to do is you take a yogurt cup, you fill it up with water, you stick your teeth or the teeth of the cow, of course, into that yogurt cup and you do sonography with your rectal probe. That works very nicely. i show you some pictures of teeth. Again, the anatomy is very simple. We have the gland sinus up here. We have the big vessels, a cross section here. Then we have the teeth sinus, teeth sinus again, and the area of the Rosetta Furstenberg. This is just a normal situation. In the cross section, here in the area of the venous ring, we see the big veins. And a little bit further down, we see small veins just underneath the mucosa. This is a pathological case. It's a longitudinal section. Again, we see here the gland sinus, the big veins. They're quite impressive in this case. Then the teeth sinus, which looks still normally. However, we have a problem down here in the area of the Rosetta Furstenberg. So this represents a case of a distal teeth obstruction. Of course, you may already feel that by palpation, by rolling the teeth between thumb and index finger, or you can use that instrument according to Dr. Fritz, as I showed you before. Now let's talk about preparation for teeth surgery in general. If it is an elective case, if it's not an emergency case, we usually take the cows off feed for 12 to 24 hours in order that we can have the cows in lateral recumbency later on and perform the surgery very clean and very quiet. If you have an emergency case, for example, a full thickness teeth laceration, you will not to decide to wait another 12 hours, you have to do surgery as soon as possible so that the chance of infection remains low. So we sedate the cow, put the cow in lateral recumbency with the affected teeth uppermost, we clip the hair, we scrub the surgical field, we perform a local anesthesia, we do a final preparation of the surgical field, we prepare the table and drape the surgical field. Some pictures that highlight everything. So we have the cow here in lateral recumbency. Um, several things that I would like to highlight. First of all, the padding in the area of the forelimbs. Then we pull the lower forelimb forward. This is both in order to reduce the chance of radial paresis or paralysis. Then we have the, the table slightly oblique with the head lower. The reason for that is that if there is draining any rumen juice, then it can drain through the nose and through the mouth towards outside, and the chance that it enters into the respiratory tract is much lower. So always keep the cow like that. 
Then we clip, we perform a first preparation, then a local anesthesia. This is usually performed just by infiltration of the local anesthetic at the base of the teat. I usually use about 20 mils per teat. It's shown here. Because it's in the area of the big vessels, it bleeds a little bit. That's the reason why I try to do the whole circumferential infiltration only from two points. I enter the skin here and I enter the skin on the other side and I don't do too many perforations of the skin. Of the skin. Then the final preparation, preparation of the surgery table of the instruments. Here you have the instrumentation for the teloresectoscopy. And the final draping of the cow. In this way, you can really work nicely and clean. Now the cow is ready. We did the workup. Now we talk about the surgical interventions. I will talk about teeth fistula, conjoined supernumerary teats, open teeth lacerations, and on the various pathologies that as are associated with impeded milk flow. I will not talk about teeth warts. This is more general surgical topic. We start with the teeth fistula. Teeth fistula, as shown here, represent a direct opening from the inside of the teeth to the outside. So milk is draining from this opening. There is a quite high chance that an ascending infection will occur and mastitis is one of the most frequent complications of this problem. That's the reason why you cannot just do nothing. Teeth fistula are most frequently um, acquired as a complication after full thickness teeth lacerations, either as a secondary intention healing or as a dehiscence after you tried to reach a primary wound healing. Treatment consists of an excision of an elliptical full thickness piece of the teeth wall with the fistula in the center and a three layer closure. Here an example, or two examples. You have the fistula here. You see that there was a laceration, a partial thickness, and here for sure a full thickness laceration. Another case here where you see milk dripping out of the fistula. And this is how we correct this, in that we remove that elliptical part of the teeth wall. We have the fistula in the center, and after having removed the whole part, we suture it in three layers. I will talk about how to do the closure of the teeth wall later on when we talk about teeth lacerations. One of the most important differentials is a conjoined supernumerary teeth. So here we see an additional teeth that is just attached to the principal teeth at its base. Conjoined supernumerary teeth have a known gland tissue. This represents not an acquired, but it represents a congenital disorder. And it remains most frequently undetected until after calving and first milking. Such additional teats here, they usually interfere with milking. This is one of the reasons why an intervention should be initiated. The other reason is the fact that these teats here and the gland tissue that belongs to these teats are very often infected. So there is a mastitis present in this area. If you have any problems with diagnosis, if you are not quite sure, the diagnostic workup includes sonography, which will allow you to see the septum in between the T 
teeth sinus of the normal teeth, of the primary teeth, and the accessory teeth. Or what you can do alternatively is to inject some dye into one of the two openings, and then you milk from both openings. And if it is a supernumerary conjoined teeth, the colored milk should only exit from one of the openings from that in which you injected the dye. If the dye is coming out through both openings, it means there is communication, and then we have a teeth fistula. The treatment options is either reconstruction and closure. So we try to reconstruct here the main teeth and close the additional teeth. But it is important that we treat mastitis that is present before. Or we can try, and I, I would like to um, put an emphasis on that, we try to do an anastomosis between the two parts of the teeth, or between these two teeth. And this is only indicated if the gland tissue of the supernumerary teeth uh, contains a lot of milk. So if the volume is very high, we can try that. But it's still a trial. Here we have some intraoperative pictures. This is here the opening into the teeth sinus of the additional teeth. We can introduce the cannula into proximal direction. Here on the right side, what we see is the coloring of the milk. We injected some red dye into the main teeth and the milk exiting the conjoined teeth has a normal white color. So it's not a fistula, it's a conjoined supernumerary teeth. I would like to come back to the anastomosis. It's possible that you open the septum between the, the, teat, uh, the two teeth sinuses to make a hole that is as big as possible. However, in my personal experience, if you milk these cows for one, two, three, four months, the hole is getting smaller, and at the end, you will end up with the same problem as at the beginning. So I don't do that anymore, except the owner urges me to do it. So usually, what I do surgically is I go back here, that I just reshape the main teeth, remove this part here, and close it. I come to the open teeth lacerations. What are the criteria for evaluation? Is it a full thickness or a partial thickness laceration? Is milk draining through the wound or not? Important for me is to know whether edema is present. If there is edema present, the prognosis for primary healing is usually reduced. I need to know the interval between injury and my repair. Is it exceeding 24 hours? The prognosis is getting worse. I'm interested in the degree of contamination on the amount of tissue loss, which will allow to let me decide whether a primary healing is an option. The direction of the laceration is important. Of course, a longitudinal laceration has the better prognosis because of the blood supply than a transverse laceration. And the site of laceration is important. We have proximal of the big veins, it's bleeding a lot. We have distal of the streak canal, which may pose a problem if it is affected. We have various repair options. We can aim at the primary wound healing, what we usually do. We can also aim at the secondary wound healing, but only if a partial thickness laceration is present. Otherwise, we have a permanent opening into the um, other which means that we will have a mastitis and an infection. We may aiming at the tertiary wound healing after secondary, or we may aim it, aiming at teeth amputation. Primary wound healing, that's what we usual, usually aim at. We perform a wound debridement. We just take off a very, very small uh, strip 
of the skin in the area of the wound edges. Then we adapt the wound. I usually use a three layer closure with a deep intermediate layer, a more superficial intermediate layer and a skin suture. In the area of the street canal, I, I will show that later on, I usually perform a two layers closure. I use monofilament polyglycolic acid suture material of the size USP 4.0, so it's quite a small suture material. Some examples, some pictures. We have here a laceration at the base of the teeth. And the most important thing in such cases is that you stop bleeding. You have to find the vessels, you have to ligate them, otherwise the cow will die from bleeding. And only after you have done that, you can think of reconstructing the laceration. We have another example here, longitudinal, full thickness laceration. So there is milk exiting the wound. It looks like the streak canal is affected. We start to prepare the surgical field. We curette it, we remove the debris, and we are able now to better visualize the streak canal. It seems to be intact, except from the area of the Rosetta Furstenberg, which is completely detached from the surrounding tissue. So we can try to reconstruct this. We perform a first deep layer, if possible not perforating, but really just outside the mucosa. We bring the different um, parts together. Next step would be an intermediate layer, as shown here. And the skin layer is shown here. I always put the clamp, if possible, on the base of the teeth in order to reduce bleeding. So this is the situation at, at day 11 of the removal of the skin stitches. It, it looks nice. However, it's only successful if there is no mastitis present and if this teeth is really milkable. It can look very nicely, but as long as it's not milkable with the milking machine, it's of no use. So just looking nice is not enough in teeth surgery. I mentioned before that if there is any laceration in the area of the street canal, I usually only perform two suture layers. An intermediate suture layer, just simple interrupted, and then a skin layer. But then I administer this type of, of cannula into the street canal. This part here remains into the street canal and it allows the healing of the street canal around this stent. It stays in for 10 days and we remove it after 10 days and remove the sutures at the same time. This red cap here can be removed and milk can drain passively out of this teeth. Let's talk about aftercare in teeth lacerations. We perform passive milk drainage usually for 10 days some colleagues, they only perform it for five days and, and milk the cow earlier. We always do it for 10 days. Um, the frequency of passive milk drainage depends on the milk yield. We administer antimicrobial prophylaxis every second passive milk drainage in order to, pre to prevent the occurrence of a mastitis. We remove the skin sutures and the cannula if implanted at day 11 and we do machine milking at day 11. There has been a nice paper published um, in 2016 from Nichols and collaborators, and according to prognosis, they mentioned that 75% of perforating open teeth lacerations, they come back to normal milking after reconstruction. The duration in between trauma and repair 
had a significant negative impact on the outcome if it, ex it exceeded 24 hours, and also the fact that a mastitis, a mastitis was present at the time of repair had a negative impact. So we have time, presence of mastitis. Teat amputation, I perform that in case of excessive tissue loss or if the configuration of the laceration does not allow me to perform a primary wound closure. Be aware that any mastitis present at that time must be treated before you perform an amputation if you perform a closed amputation. If it's an open amputation, it's different. So these are indications for me to perform an amputation. I try to shape a fish mouth like stump. We see here the mucosa, intermediate layer and the skin layer. Then we perform a first deep suture just outside the mucosa, a second in the intermediate layer and then we can finally adapt the teat skin. In this case, we had a very chronic mastitis and we decided to perform an open teat amputation where we suture the mucosa to the intermediate layer or to the skin. I come to the pathologies that are associated with impeded milk flow. They can be either located very proximally or in the area of the teeth sinus, or the streak canal and the Rosetta Furstenberg. First of all, I'd like to show you a short video sequence. I'll show it again. It's a longitudinal section. We have the teeth here, the tip of the teeth to the right, and up here there is obstructing tissue, and what really obstructs is a big vein. So in the area of the Rosetta Furstenberg, we have a huge, huge vein which interferes with filling of the teeth. So it's an obstruction by a varicose vein. Um, this problem has been nicely described in a paper by Laura Day in 2013. They offered the following treatment options, either sclerotherapy by injection of dextrose solution into the enlarged part of the vein, or ligation and sclerotherapy, or phlebectomy. And they found a prognosis which was quite favorable after any of these surgical interventions. So 84% of the cows that they had had an improvement of milk flow after that surgery. I only have experience with phlebectomy, and I usually ask um, some colleagues from animal surgery, uh, not animal, human surgery, sorry, to help me doing that. They are very skilled in, in removing veins. They are very fast. And the chance that uh, severe bleeding occurs is much lower. In comparison, I would try to do it. But I can support the findings of the colleagues from Canada that the prognosis after removal of the big vein is quite good. It's favorable. A completely different thing do we see here in these sonographic pictures. So this is an obstruction in the area of the teeth sinus that has a very broad attachment to the teeth wall. There have been performed attempts in the past trying to come up with a good solution for such problems. Of course, you have to remove the granulation tissue. But the problem is that it will grow up again if you don't do anything against it. And what has been done in the past is, for example, a transplantation of vaginal mucosa into the teeth. It has been described by a colleague from Zurich, Mark Hassig, many, many years ago. Uh, we did some attempts with implanting some grafts. These are vessel grafts from human medicine. But finally, I have to say that not any of these techniques, not one of these techniques, really offers you a good long-term prognosis. For short term, two or three months, it's okay. But later on, you will 
um, run into problems with milking with an obstruction um, occurring again. The prognosis is completely different in a case like that. That's also an obstruction, um, obstructing tissue in the area of the teeth sinus, but we have a very thin pedicle here. And of course, if you ligate it at the base, remove the granulation tissue, then the prognosis is very favorable. Such multiple polyps, as you see here, they also have a favorable prognosis as long as you're able to remove them completely. And I usually try to remove them by introducing the telorosectoscope through the streak canal, retrograde, and I just cauterize them and take them out. You see the pieces here on this 4x4. Four four. Now I come to the distal teeth stenosis here in the area of the Rosetta Furstenberg. We have several treatment options. We can try to cut it out blindly, which we don't do anymore. You can perform a lateral telotomy, or if you have a telescope available, we should try to re remove it by telescopy. Telotomy means a longitudinal incision on the lateral side of the teeth. We try to expose the Rosetta Furstenberg, and you see here these pieces of tissue that will interact with milk flow later on. You just cut them out with a scalpel blade. Alternatively, we now routinely use telescopy. So we do a lateral telescopy. Um, we look versus the Rosetta Furstenberg, and we use that metal probe introduced here through the streak canal for guiding the streak canal. So here we see several pictures taken from proximal. You see here the obstructing tissue that forms a flap or obstructing tissue here around the streak canal opening. This is the metal probe introduced. A similar finding here and again a similar finding here. So the goal is to <coughs> cauterize this and take it out in order that it cannot interfere with uh, milking anymore. First, I would like to show you a video of a normal Rosetta Furstenberg. This is still the teeth wall here. Now we go down. You see the cannula, the metal cannula, cannula introduced through the streak canal, and we see the normal Rosetta Furstenberg around it. This example here shows you a distal teeth obstruction. Again, the cannula. Here we have the cautery sling. Now we see it much better. All this tissue here will interfere with milking as soon as there is milk coming from proximal. Go further, you see here that we can cauterize this tissue and take it off. I go a little bit further again, and I would like to show you how it looks like at the end. It's very important that you're able to remove really all the affected tissue. So now it looks much better here. There is no more tissue interfering with milk flow. I test the milk flow immediately after surgery before I close the incision. After care, after teloscopy, um, passive milk drainage for three days, antimicrobial prophylaxis every second passive milk drainage. We Always administer a melting teeth boogie into the streak canal in order to keep it patent. We do that for at least 10 days. We resume machine milking at day four and we remove the sutures at day 11. There has been done quite a lot of work in this area in the past and I would like to just shortly summarize the prognosis. In the lactation following 
the surgical intervention, still 50% of the cows showed normal milk flow. Teat sinusitis had a negative impact on the prognosis because it predisposed, uh, predisposed for mastitis. Telorhizectoscopy was found to be superior towards telotomy in terms of complications and costs because aftercare is much longer in cases of telotomy. And the somatic cell count did not return to normal for many of these cows even after six months. So that, this is a limiting problem. I come to the last pathology that I would like to show you. It's a milk stone. We see the milk stone here. I'll just make this video a little bit faster and you see that's a really completely movable thing here. It's not attached to the wall. In such cases, what we do, we, we enter a sterilized clamp through the street canal into the teeth sinus and we just try to pull it out. If it's too big, the piece, we try to crush it, we try to make two pieces out of it with the clamp and then we pull it out. We see quite a lot of these cases in the clinic and um, that's the reason why I show it to you because I realized that some veterinarians, they just mix it up with a, with a real teeth obstruction that remains in place. This is a summary of the complications that may occur after teeth surgery. It includes mastitis, wound infection, the hissens and fistula formation, milk flow impediment, and severe bleeding. I come up with the take home messages. The goals, it's the restoration of normal milk flow. And the second, also very important goal is to prevent the occurrence of a mastitis. Surgical interventions in the area of the teeth should be well planned, performed under very clean conditions. You should try to administer accurate and precise surgical technique and an adequate instrumentation should be available. The prognosis depends very much on the primary pathology. It may vary from favorable to a very bad prognosis, depending again on the pathology. There are a lot of research gaps remaining. I would last just um, like to mention two of them. There is still a problem. We don't know how to handle teeth sinus obstructions that have a broad communication with the teeth wall. They still have a, a bad prognosis in the long term. And in my opinion, there's, there are still not enough retrospective or even prospective studies available dealing with the long-term prognosis of the teeth lacerations and outflow disorders. I would like to thank all the persons of our clinic that did some pictures that helped in the, in the preparation of this presentation. And with this picture of the very nice Swiss Alps, here it's the Eigen Nordwall here, I would like to finalize my presentation, I would like to say thanks, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you.